Hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network, or ECPN, a network of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. My name is Kari Rayner, and I am the webinar coordinator for the 2016-2017 term. Today's webinar is entitled, Picking Up the Pieces, Accepting, Preventing, and Learning from Mistakes as an Emerging Conservation Professional. Before we turn to today's program, I would I'd like to quickly familiarize everyone with the GoToWebinar program. You can use the control panel to make modifications to your audio settings. All attendees are automatically muted by the program, but you can communicate with us and ask questions during the webinar through the question box. If you'd like, you can also hide the control panel with the orange arrow at the top of your screen. I'd like to take a moment to briefly share information about ECPN and our webinar series. ECPN is a network within AIC that is dedicated to supporting conservation professionals in the first stages of their careers. Please visit our page on the AIC website, our Facebook page, or our wiki resources for emerging conservators for more details of our activities. ECPN has some exciting upcoming events at the 2017 annual meeting in Chicago that I'd like to quickly promote as well. Our primary event consists of a lightning round poster session showcasing the contributions of emerging conservators to the annual meeting. Following the session, bus service will be provided to a happy hour at the Conservation Center in Chicago. These events are free, but will require tickets through the AIC website. We are also in the process of scheduling a business meeting, during which ECPN officers will, re will report on this year's activities and initiatives, and we hope you will join us at these events. Additionally, ECPN is currently seeking applications for several open positions for the 2017-2018 term. All positions have a duration of two years beginning in June of 2017. If you are a pre-program, conservation graduate student, or recent graduate who would like to advocate for emerging conservators and help AIC develop resources for your peer group, please contact Rebecca Gridley for open position descriptions and application information at the email you see on the screen. Applications are due by April 14th. Now for a bit about our webinar series. ECPN organizes two webinars each year on topics relevant to emerging conservators. Our webinars are all recorded and the full videos are available on the AIC YouTube channel. If you have any ideas for future webinar topics, please feel free to contact ECPN at the email you see on the screen or post suggestions on the ECPN Facebook group. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our four speakers for today's webinar, Picking Up the Pieces, Accepting, Preventing, and Learning from Mistakes as an Emerging Conservation Professional. Aisha Fuentes and Geneva Griswold are recent graduates of the UCLA Getty Program in Conservation. As graduate students, Aisha and Geneva presented on evaluating and preventing setbacks at ANAGPIC, the Association of North American Graduate Programs in Conservation Conference, in 2012. They will discuss this presentation and reflect on what they have personally learned as their careers have developed in the five years since. Aisha is a first year NPHIL PhD candidate in the Department of History of Art and Archaeology at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and Geneva is now an Associate Objects Conservator at the Seattle Art Museum. Michelle Marincola is the Sherman, Sherman Fairchild Distinguished Professor of Conservation of the Conservation Center at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, and Managing Conservator for the Acton Collection at NYU's Villa La Pietra in Florence. She has previously lectured and published on the topic of mistakes and sources of error, and she will be drawing on this work today in her presentation. Tony Siegel is the Senior Conservator of Objects at the Strauss Center for Conservation of the Harvard Art Museum. Tony recently presented on the topic of mistakes and setbacks at the Objects Tips session at the 2016 AIC Annual Meeting in Montreal, and he will be discussing some examples of real-life experiences dealing with mistakes. If you'd like to see more extensive biographies for our speakers, please visit the blog post regarding the webinar on AIC's blog, Conservators Converse. So let's begin with Aisha and Geneva to set the stage for why discussing how to accept, prevent, and learn from mistakes is so important for emerging conservation professionals, and explore how they each personally relate to this topic. Aisha will begin by recapping some of their main points from their ANAGPIC paper. Aisha? 
Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, as she said, my name is Aisha Fuentes, and I graduated with Geneva from the UCLA Getty MA program in the conservation of archaeological and ethnographic materials in 2014. And we gave this paper, um, The Dead Bucket, which you see the first slide from it there, The Dead Bucket, an inexperienced conservator's guide for evaluating setbacks. Um, we actually gave this in 2012, and it was our first year of grad school. And I think one of the reasons why we gave it at that point is we thought, okay, this is a graduate conference. Um, what's something that we all have in common? What's something that we could speak to? We didn't have a lot of professional experience. And when we sat around and we talked to everyone in our cohort, you know, we all kind of had experiences of things that we had, mistakes that we had made. And, and it was a bonding experience just being able to share those things. And I thought, well, what, you know, could that, in fact, be the material for a paper? Um, and then a friend of mine, the title itself, The Dead Bucket, a friend of mine asked me when I was still in school, you know, what do you guys do when you can't fix something? Is there a dead bucket in the studio where you just take it and you, you leave it? And I said, uh, no, there's no dead bucket. But I also said, I don't, I don't know what I do when I can't fix something. I, I haven't got to that yet. Um, just in terms of projects, you know, my skills hadn't gotten that far. So it was interesting. And, and I remember at the time we were having this um, vocabulary issue when we pre presented the paper to our mentors at the UCLA Getty program. And we said, we want to do a paper about, um, you know, mistakes or setbacks or limitations. And, and it turned into this really intense conversation about what do we mean mistake? What do we mean shortcoming? You know, how are we talking about this? And at, at the time, it, it felt very tedious. Um, but now that I think of it, we were really working out what that language was. How do we talk to our mentors about this? And how do we talk to each other um, as a professional community of what it is? And then with the illustrations, I'm going to show you a few, a few slides from it um, as I'm talking. With the illustrations, is how, do, how do we really illustrate our mistakes when we don't even have that much experience to draw from? Our portfolios aren't that big. So instead, we kind of looked at contemporary artists who were questioning the integrity of objects. So that's why you have the Gordon Matta Clark here, and then there'll be another one in a second. Yeah, next. Thank you. Um, Ai Weiwei, again, just kind of questioning, you know, What's the art piece? What's the what's the property? Um, but anyway, so we came we pulled together with all of our cohort, and between us, we came came up with a couple stories about um, mistakes that we had made, and we distilled them to th three categories, more or less. The first being observa observations and judgments. The second, personal limitations um, and just personal workflow, and then the third was quote unquote untreatable materials. So what do we get? What happens when we get to the end of our of our um, toolbox, more or less. Could I have the next, please? Thanks. Um, so the first one we had was someone who had just clearly walked walked a sculpture into a door. She had misjudged the amount of space and time and the, you know, the whole process. And it was just thinking about how do we learn to move with objects? Like, how is that part of our, of our education as conservators? What is, what are our bodies? What is the physical aspect of the work? Um, and then next slide, please. And uh, again, another example where it was really just a question of knowing oneself within the working process. Someone was hungry, um, they turned to check something and knock something off the table and, and ended up doing more damage to the, to the figure. Um, and it was really just a question of saying, like, where, where am I right now? Am I thinking about the object? Am I thinking about myself in relation to the object? Uh, next one, please. And then this last example was another um, member of the cohort who really who had been assigned to this object as a as an assignment and said you know take it apart make it look a little bit better put it back together get rid of some of this adhesive um, and after many many trials the adhesive could be reduced very very little and it, it got to a point where the student was really questioning whether or not they were harming the object um, by trying to intervene anymore and kind of had to give up so it was learning about decision making skills and the 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 extent of our of our capacities as conservators at that point uh, next please um, and then in the long term, in the five years since, I think um, I've learned a lot about the, the limits of my ability, but also accepting those limitations as um, really fantastic opportunities. So in the first case, there's it, critically engaging with the skills that I've been given with everything that my mentors have given, and but also really asking myself why I'm doing things. Why do we save some objects and not others? And engaging with ethics and pedagogy um, and be more abstract about it. And then secondly, I've, you know, 
looking at something as a limitation is just an opportunity to be more creative to me. So if you don't have that ideal treatment, if you don't have that ideal the right amount of time, like do the best that you can with what you've got. Um, and I think in terms of practical things, that's that's really what I've taken. Right. Great, thank you, Aisha. Um, would you like to chime in, Geneva? Yes, I would. Yeah, this is Geneva here. Um, and I just have a few quick comments, and we can go to the next slide, regarding reception of the dead bucket paper. Um, initially, Aisha and I envisioned an anonymous blog or online platform as a follow-up to the paper. Um, but while a non-punitive reporting system is important, in retrospect, I think we both believe that it's not enough Discussion of setbacks need to occur all the time, and they needn't be anonymous. The second comment is following, following the paper, um, Aisha and I organized a graduate symposium for students of conservation and preservation. And this occurred the next year, and it was a half day of talks following an ag pick. We wanted to hear voices from students in other training programs, such as historic preservation and heritage studies, and I believe the symposium was successful in expanding our approaches to problem solving and contextualizing, contextualizing setbacks within an expanded peer group. And then finally, um, during the Q&A session when the dead bucket paper was presented, Peggy Ellis asked the question, what do you want from your mentors? And this question at first floored Aisha and I. Um, but I've hung on to, to the question and its potential ever since. What do you want from your mentors? Uh, next slide, please. So from there, I'd like to share three, three reflections, which include the first, recognizing one's personal working patterns in order to plan effectively, cultivating networks from which to guide, from which to seek guidance, and changing our cultures to prevent the suppression of setbacks. Next. So recognizing one's personal working patterns in order to plan effectively. These are three tenets I tend to keep in mind. Be humble, do not be hasty. Time management and estimation of treatment time are skills that I'm still refining as an emerging conservator. Um, depending on the project, it may take me several weeks to walk around an object, ponder it, probe it, test off the object, and then to act small, repeatedly. Recognizing this personal working pattern in myself allows me to plan my time most effectively and to consider this time productive rather than a setback, such as viewing it as working too slow. When time is limited, plan ahead. Perhaps propose longer term stepwise treatments. You may only have time to do the first step, such as before an object goes on exhibition, but you can lay a course of action that you or someone else can follow going forward. Um, and if this is the case, don't skimp on documenting your reasoned approach using words and images. Finally, there are many right ways of doing things. With time and experience, my expectations about what an object needs are sharpening. In rereading the dead bucket paper, um, my self-awareness is being cultivated. I am better able to contextualize my setbacks and I am be asking better questions. So take solace in that. Take solace in time and your experience as it builds. Next slide. So cultivating networks from which to seek guidance. Admit when you do not know something and you can simply admit it to yourself um, and accept guidance, especially when it is freely offered. Ask questions of your colleagues and mentors, and cultivate a network. Write them often with questions or project updates. This feedback gives me the confidence to move forward. It can provide redirection or mitigate setbacks when they occur. Develop expertise through others. Cumulative knowledge is developed by being the point person for a given topic. Being willing, open, and active in collecting from varied sources and suggestions. Personally, one of the most meaningful parts of being a conservator is casting our nets wide and seeing what is captured in doing so. Next slide. Changing our culture to prevent the suppression of mistakes. As a mentor, 
as we increase in years in our careers, um, normalize mistakes by demonstrating that they happen, talking about them, discuss protocols for reporting damage, and converse often about how to do differently next time. And finally, foster an inclusive lab environment based on systematic exploration and discourse. One of my mentors um, would gather the entire lab around her bench when she was trying something new, enabling all of us to approach problem solving and experimentation as a team. And I have found this particularly helpful ever since. Next slide. So thank you, and I'll leave you here with a resource um, which Aisha and I pondered a lot while writing the paper, which is called Admitting Failure. And it's an online community encouraging transparency and open dialogue about failure within greater civil society. And as they claim, by sharing what does not work, we collectively accelerate the process of finding what does, enabling us to maximize the learning and innovation required to solve complex problems. I think that is directly applicable to the field of conservation. So their website provides a platform for reading and sharing our own stories about failure, for understanding why failure is productive, and they even offer consultation on how to fail forward <laughs> within your own life or your own um, community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Geneva and Aisha. It's really fantastic to hear your thoughts on this topic. Um, and this website, I'd like to second that. I, I've gone to it since being introduced to it by um, Geneva and Aisha, and it's really fantastic. Um, our next speaker, Michelle Marincola, will provide a more theoretical angle from her influential research into the subject of human error. And I'd like to point out that in her role as an educator, Michelle emphasizes the importance of understanding and managing human error to her first year NYU students every year. So Michelle, if you'd like to begin. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to review some points that I published in 2011 with my colleague, the British paintings conservator, Sarah Macy. And you'll find a link to that article on the blog. And so what I'll talk about are the types of errors that people make and some misconceptions about how to prevent them, some examples of common mistakes in conservation and tips on how to avoid them or at least cut down on their frequency because we all make mistakes. Next. In the field of conservation, we can consider that our increasing specialization, our expertise, and then the public recognition that we get for what we do have encouraged a really human response in us, and that's that we should be professionally infallible. Just think about how irreplaceable the things are that we work on. Making a mistake then takes on this kind of moral flavor. We think we lack motivation to do a better job, or we're incompetent, or we're just clumsy. And this leads us to hide our mistakes. It leads to secrecy. We don't tell each other about what we've done. And in the long run, this just hurts our profession. Because as everybody knows, making mistakes is one of the best ways to learn. Next. So what is an error exactly? The word's been applied by cognitive psychologists to define intentional actions that either did not go as planned or failed to achieve their desired end. And given the possibilities, the kinds of errors that people make are actually relatively few, and they tend to follow certain patterns. Psychologists and error experts, who were known as human factors researchers, tend to divide them into two broad categories. There are errors of execution, where things didn't go as planned, and rule and knowledge-based errors, where a person lacks the knowledge that's necessary to complete a task successfully. Next. So let's start with rule and knowledge-based errors. They happen when tasks are new and complex, and that's because we're wired to rely on what's worked in the past. And here's the double whammy. They're most common to people starting out in their careers and to professions with an expanding knowledge base, yep, like conservation. Even a rudimentary glance at the history of conservation in the 20th century turns up lots of examples. False conclusions drawn from incomplete data sets, like the varnishing of certain impressions paintings, or uh, other errors in that side, of that type. And no person, no profession, can grow without making these kinds of mistakes. And we recognize this since we tend to forgive them 
and consider them forgivable. Next slide. And I made a knowledge-based error when I identified the polychromy on this medieval German sculpture as modern. That was based on the analysis done of the azurite blue layer where the arrow is pointing, because it contained a small amount of barite. And barite, I knew, was a 19th century paint extensor, extender. So I anchored on that fact and misinterpreted the analytical results. I found out later, after I had published my conclusions, that a small amount of barite is in fact a naturally occurring contaminant of azurite, and it's been identified on late medieval South German painting. So what I had interpreted as a smoking gun for later repainting was in fact the marker for authenticity. And from this I learned to never draw conclusions from a single piece of data, especially when it involves the authenticity of a work of art. Next. And here's the second category errors of execution in either planning or performance. You tend to know right away if you've made an error of execution. You actually know how to do something correctly, but you didn't do it. This is very common when we're doing familiar tasks. That's because humans have evolved levels of automaticity for well-practiced activity. And this leaves us with a mental workspace for tackling the more complex problems of life. And everybody makes these types of mistakes but the experts are especially prone to them, perhaps because of the high level of routine automatic activity in their work. Next. And here's a good example of this type of error. This was published by wall painting conservator Isabel Braher. She had mounted a detached fresco in her studio to a rigid support for reinstallation in its church. And once she was on site with the mounted fresco, she was shocked to discover it didn't fit back inside. She had forgotten to measure the door. So this is a typical example of what we would call a lapse. Braher had the knowledge and ability to plan and execute such a project successfully, and I'm pretty sure she knew how to measure a door. But through an oversight, she failed to complete a small and critical part of the procedure. Multi-step processes like the one involved here, provide more opportunity for errors of execution. Next. And routine but multi-step activities can lead to something called latent error. These are conditions that exist in the workplace that create the potential of unsafe action. So basically an accident waiting to happen. And some examples, a museum saves money in the short term by postponing climate system maintenance, or it reduces its conservation staff, but keeps the same busy exhibition schedule. And on an individual level, how often are you as a conservator rushed and you neglect to label your reagent bottles and they're filled with identical looking, but very different solvents? More than one conservator has mentioned to me that she did this and applied the wrong solvent to a work of art. Next. Every museum has experienced these errors of planning or performance. And this is just one example where a restored area of this Vermeer was sampled for analysis rather than the original paint because the scientist was tired. And it was late on a Friday. And as a consequence, Indian yellow was incorrectly identified as a 17th century Dutch uh, pigment. We become distracted or overwhelmed by information or overconfident, and we make mistakes despite our training, our innate caution, and our skill. And these are the embarrassing errors. These are the ones we're afraid to admit and the ones we criticize in other people. And how common they are in our field is really impossible to say because we, like many disciplines, don't keep records of our errors. And yet we know from fields that do, like ER medicine, that mistakes of planning and performance are not made significantly less common by increasing expertise or skill level. So more training doesn't solve this problem. Next. And why? That's because, in part, the structure and the limitations of the human brain make it so. Neurobiological research has confirmed that our minds are wired to handle complex problems through a series of analog simplifications, where we use past experience to make sense of the new or the unexpected. And this is a really efficient structure at processing huge amounts of data, but it has limitations. 
Most of us, for example, can hold only seven to nine pieces of unrelated data in our minds at a time. Think of a telephone number. This makes it easy to lose mindfulness and forget a small but critical step in a multi-step process. And so one of the things we do to cope is we rely on heuristics. Next. And these are shortcuts in thinking or rules of thumb. And they're real time savers. And they're also surprisingly effective. There are data indicating that heuristics help us make the right decision more often than not. But not always. Heuristics can fail. For example, if you follow a shortcut of reasoning, you may exclude essential data by narrowing your focus of inquiry too soon in a process called anchoring. And this is what I did with the medieval sculpture. Next. And here's an example of one common heuristic-based mistake in conservations, representativeness error. And that's made when we're overly influenced by what's typically true. And the heuristic for this might be, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Except when it's not a duck, and we miss the atypical variant. And this is especially common in technical studies of artworks, because our knowledge base is still expanding. Connoisseurs of Southeast Asian gray wax sculptures, like this one, know that genuine ancient Cambodian sculpture presents an ochre-colored service, as you see here, presumably the result of weathering, and very different from the gray-green color of the freshly cut stone. And you can see that in the chip on the bottom image. And this has led to the conviction that all Cambodian sculpture with this distinctive weathered surface is genuine. That's the heuristic. Unfortunately, objects we know to be forgeries exhibit a similar looking surface. Next. Relying too much on heuristics leaves us vulnerable to our biases. The IKEA effect is a common bias in conservation, and that's disproportionately valuing the things that you've labored over. There are many steps in restoration that stimulate the IKEA effect. We become attached to our lousy in-painting, and at least in my case, really our lousy fills, because they're so hard to do. And sometimes it's better just to declare your work a disaster and to start over again. Next. And we're certainly not free of bias in our scientific investigations and lab experiments. There's confirmation bias. This is our tendency to search for or interpret information that confirms our preconceptions, and that leads to statistical error. Next. Results of experiments using large sample sets are more precise. There are fewer extremes. So note in this graph how the margin of error goes way down as the sample size increases to the right. But that doesn't stop us from using data from small sample sets in our research. We intuit that these are probably fine, despite good evidence to the contrary. And this puts it at us at high risk of failing to confirm a true hypothesis or believing in a false one. We shouldn't follow our intuition that a sample size is large enough, but instead run statistical computations to determine if that's in fact true. Next. So what can we do on an individual level to prevent errors or at least reduce their frequency? Broadly speaking, all the errors we've talked about arise from the limitations of the human brain and information overload of our conscious workspace. And this can create bias and unhelpful shortcuts in our thinking. Being aware of these things is therefore very important as they can affect us all, but especially they affect us when we're stressed, tired, distracted, or we're working at the limit of our technical ability and knowledge. Next. And as Geneva said, share case studies. That's really important. Think about how you think, practice metacognition, and use your intuition wisely. Intuition works best when you're really expert in a field. Slow your pace of work if you can. And if you can't, get up from your chair and take a break every once in a while. Examine your familiar procedures and tweak them so the familiar doesn't become routine, setting up latent error. And use checklists. These are proven tools for reducing error in the ER. 
and then collaborate and ask for feedback. Next. And remember, if you're making mistakes, this means you're alive and that you're working. And because it is, after all, really part of our human nature and it comes along with growth, creativity, and fulfillment of our potential. Next. So here's some links to uh, some more on this topic, and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Michelle. This is fantastic information um, to be disseminating in the field, um, and we're really so pleased that you could present on your research today. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce Tony oops, Siegel, who, um, sorry, we, seem to have lost the place in the program. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Tony Siegel, who will be wrapping up the program with a discussion of real-life examples uh, of case studies responding to and managing mistakes. So, Tony, if you'd like to begin. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening. Um, and thanks to uh, my fellow presenters. So, the theme of my presentation is, quote, a fail shared is not a failure. And I'll say next and hope uh, the images will show up soon. Um, I think that's really a fascinating quote. It's uh, from uh, my friend, archaeologist Teresa Huntsman's Snarkyology blog. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, and the quote is drawn from a terrific lecture by Sean Graham entitled Failing Productively in Digital Archaeology. Uh, it's well worth a, a look. Uh, next, please. Teresa says, and I quote, we don't talk about our failures. We're heavily discouraged to talk about our failures. And because of this, we rarely document our failures. And this in and of itself is a failure because we are dooming ourselves and others in our field to making the same mistakes again. She goes on to say, we all say that you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And we've all had failures. If we aren't in positions to fail openly, I think it's important that we at least try to document these failures in a sustainable way, close quote. She discusses the difficulties of emerging professionals to discuss mistakes and failures openly and says, for those in secure career roles, can you help us by talking about failure more openly? If we can normalize it, we can have a much healthier relationship with our institutions and the field at large. Uh, close quote again. Uh, and this is me uh, saying that I believe this is the task before the profession now, and particularly uh, the training programs. Museum and private labs that accept interns and fellows must also develop an open attitude towards acknowledging, discussing, and learning from mistakes on all levels. Next, please. Um, change, uh, change the slide, please. OK, well, I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, uh, here are some of my mistakes and what I've done to try to avoid repeating them in the future. Uh, while sampling a ceramic vessel to extract material for a thermal luminescence test, uh, sweating in a small dark room with a dim red safe light, I accidentally drilled through the vessel. I was horrified and the owner was furious. Okay, that seems to be the beginning slide, but that's okay. Um, while I had tried to estimate the thickness and mark the drill bit, I had not done a good enough job. I was very lucky that my supervisor was supportive. Uh, lesson, always be asking yourself, how can I do this better? Properly equip yourself and devise effective methods to accomplish your task safely. 
We researched and purchased a proper long arm digital caliper to measure vessel wall thickness. I made better tape collars, thank you, uh, for the drill bit and repositioned the safe light to get better illumination. On another occasion, I had finished the reconstruction of a small footed top heavy vessel at Sardis and had placed it on a rickety table to photograph it. A teeny tiny voice in my head said, it's a little wobbly, don't you think? As I stepped away to get a camera, a second later, I heard the crash. Lesson, when handling artwork, you are never in a hurry. Slow down, learn to pay attention and to follow that tiny inner voice. Next, please. Uh, and next, again, <clears throat> how not to lose things. This Islamic Lockerbie rabbit plate was a composite of an original plate. Next, please. And many genuine but non-original sherds. Next, please. During the treatment, which involved disassembly and cleaning, I poulticed the shellac stained sherds with repeated changes of solvent gel over tissue. This continued over several weeks and necess necessitated repeated removal of sticky gel residues and tissue paper uh, using paper toweling. Next, please. These were the original remaining sherds but only at the end of the process did I discover that I'd lost one next. No doubt stuck to some paper toweling tossed in the garbage at some point. Extensive searches, including a full dumpster dive and intimate exploration of the contents were unsuccessful in recovering the shirt. Next, please. I was devastated and resolved to learn from this disaster. I decided to come up with, a new, with new procedures. We now routinely photograph shirt assemblies, indeed large groups of parts or elements from any kind of object, and print them out slightly over size. Next, please. This provides a storage location for all shirts, where if one goes missing, it can be instantly detected. Next, please. Covering the printout with a mylar sheet will protect it during a wet cleaning process. Uh, incidentally, when doing very large reconstructions, it makes uh, not having to reconstruct it over and over again uh, quite a benefit. <clears throat> uh, it's only by acknowledging these kinds of mistakes that we can learn from them and come up with solutions to do things better in the future. Next, please. And next again. Sue Costello was treating an ISNIC plate in our collection, seen here from the front. Uh, next, please. And the back. Uh, next again. A face with removing iron staining from the larger set of staple holes on the reverse of the plate Next, please. Sue made an H-bed chelator gel. The iron staining, complexing and becoming pink, was drawn into the gel after a few hours, but it also caused the pink stain to migrate into the surrounding glaze. Next, please. Gravity pulled down the slope of the ceramic. Re rinsing removed the purple stain from unglazed areas, but not from where it had become trapped under the glaze. An EDTA poultice removed some of the remaining stain, but could not reach all of it, only lightening it. Lessons learned. The pink H-bed FE complex is very soluble and mobile. Only use H-bed in a gel block on glazed ceramics to minimize water ab absorption and remember the effects of gravity. Next, please. An anonymous colleague says, uh, I quote, I was working on an ancient terracotta object in several pieces with an unfired kaolin slip. 
My supervisor insisted the slip was fired and that I should clean a test fragment by placing it in a water bath. I was two years out of grad school, began doubting myself, and figured my supervisor knew best. After soaking the test fragment overnight, approximately half of the slip had been lost right down to the terracotta and all the patina stripped away. Looking back, it is easy to see that I should have requested a meeting with my supervisor to look at the object together. I could have presented my evidence as to why I thought it was an unfired slip and hopefully uh, been convincing. I still feel awful that I damaged a piece of an object unnecessarily. This is probably the single biggest lesson I have learned in my career." End quote. And that lesson is don't be afraid or too proud to ask and even ask again. This applies to the emerging professional, but also to the mid and late career professionals who often have had less exposure to the latest materials and methods than the recent graduate. Um, okay, another, uh, I, I think this is a next, sorry. Yes, another um, uh, con contributed um, story from Rachel Sabino, who relates that she was working as an assistant conservator at a large metropolitan museum on an exhibition of contemporary glass. One of the pieces comprised numerous elements stacked into a tall vertical tower with arms. The artist gallery had recommended stabilizing mylar elements to be used when assembling it um, at the, only at the installation did she learn that the top heavy work would be installed on a low platform with no barrier, which created issues. But additionally, preparators had asked her to use a sticky wax between blocks to stabilize the piece. She says, I, originally, uh, I initially refused to do so, citing the mylar stops that the gallery had recommended. In the ensuing swirl, of trying to get the exhibition up and in my keenness to be the hero of the story, I tried tacky wax, but the block started creeping. In haste, I then tried clear quake hold gel designed for glass, thinking I could use more of it without the visual impact. This initially appeared stable, but one evening, the topmost elements went over and smashed into a million pieces. Total disaster and it still haunts me today. If I had had or made time to test with mock-ups, listened to my gut, and pushed back even harder, uh, this might not have happened. Lesson learned, I was right, but the momentum of events, the schedule, and my desire to help overcame my best judgment. Conservators are constitutionally and mentally inclined to take responsibility for things. Ambition also plays a role in wanting to shoulder responsibilities which might not be theirs to carry. I didn't listen to my gut and I didn't feel empowered seniority-wise to push back against poor planning, unreasonable time pressures. In an institutional situation, you may want to leave an email trail to document decisions which go against your best intuition and counsel. Next, please. Kate Smith relates this tale of woe. During preparation for a varnish removal, I didn't test a green color passage that turned out to be a very soluble glaze, and I bit right into it. On a painting that had never been restored by anyone ever, I caused the first damage. Best in, in painting of my life, I'll tell you that. Ugh, I have nightmares. Next, please. Switching to a different kind of advice, I just wanted to mention that accidents can easily occur in photo studios. Cables, equipment, a lot of clutter. In our museum just days ago, a poorly secured diffuser came loose from a lighting fixture and damaged an object below. Continuous hot lights 
can also quickly damage objects. So periodically review your photo setup. Use safety tether cables on all lighting equipment um, with elements that could possibly come loose and approach an artwork. Use weight bags on all your light stands and root cords to avoid tripping hazards. Next, please. If the worst happens, notify your supervisor, make the art safe and secure the area, document the incident with notes and pictures, take a deep breath, calm down, it happens to us all, and figure out how to avoid it in the future and share that information. Next, please. To recap, don't be afraid to ask questions and get advice when you need it. Compile a personal resource of people, notes, and articles on material and techniques and refer to them often. Make mock-ups when needed and possible. I always mentally rehearse my treatments, trying to forecast the risks that I, and problems I might come up against and figure out better ways to solve them. Don't allow yourself to rush or be hurried. Cultivate an awareness of your mental state. Learn how to stop and regroup when you need to. Have respect for your inner voice and follow it. Foster in an open environment where doubts can be expressed and mistakes shared. And take your mistakes and use them to find a better way for the future. Next. Finally, thanks to everyone who shared their stories. And remember that people are more important than objects, and the mistakes aren't failures. They are lessons on how to move forward. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And thank you so much for relaying these stories and for all of your great advice. Um, and I also want to thank the respondents to the survey that ECPN sent out. Um, although I, I'm not sure we're going to get a chance to talk about some of the uh, responses today, uh, we will address them in a follow-up blog post. Uh, we do have time for a question or two. Um, so I was thinking of addressing this question um, to all of our speakers. Uh, we've talked a lot about preventing and learning from mistakes, um, but if we could focus on the accepting part for a moment. Um, as conservators, we can be extremely hard on ourselves, so how can we mentally move forward and keep fear mistakes from paralyzing us or from trying new methods? Uh, so if I could direct this to um, Michelle first, perhaps, to share your thoughts on this. Sure. And I, I think a, a key uh, answer to that is uh, what Peggy Ellis had, had posed to Aisha in Geneva um, those years ago. And that is, you know, what can your mentors do to help you in this? Uh, so I would propose that what uh, really should happen is that uh, mentors, and by that I mean not only professors in the training programs, but also anyone who takes a pre-program uh, intern into his or her lab, normalize this reality. We're, everyone is going to make a mistake at some point. So let's let's talk about the likelihood of that, let's talk about where are you prone to making them, what should you do, as Tony said, when it happens, what are the, the proper steps, and to encourage the sharing of this, of, of not only first initially like go back over what was the situation in which this happened. It's not just about me, it could be about the environment, it could be about the larger uh, working situation because of this, what's called uh, the Swiss cheese model of, of failure, which is um, a model that James Reason uh, describes, where it takes a kind of lining up of a series of potential mistakes for a really big mistake to take place. So, so being aware of all of that, and that, that direction coming from the supervisor, uh, I think is, is critical. Thank you. Um, Tony, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I can only agree with what Michelle just said. I, I think a lot of 
a lot of this comes from the top. And so colleagues and supervisors need to set the tone. Um, um, as a colleague, uh, you know, I think we, we can all um, work on this. I try to, you know, let the people around me know um, when I made a mistake and done something that didn't work out just so that they won't do it again. And, and I, I think if enough people start doing that, then the atmosphere really, really changes. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Great. And um, Geneva? Yeah, I think once, you know, once you've had this discussion um, with your with your peers, take take a moment for yourself, <laughs> leave the, you know, leave the scene, um, go for a walk and just get get a bit of air and and perspective that way and and sit with it. Sometimes I find it really helpful to write things down, um, you know, what you would have done or, or what did happen just so that you do have a document of what's going forward. Sometimes it's hard to keep keep all of this um, fresh and present. Um, but yeah, take take time for yourself and and certainly be easy on yourself. And Aisha, any final thoughts? Yeah, I was just thinking that um, part of what I've learned from this is that you know our mistakes and everything, the way that we deal with them, is really conditioned by the culture in which we're working. Um, and I mean that from having worked in places that aren't Europe and the United States, um, but also just just in terms of like the workplace culture. If there's a if there's always a if you're always putting pressure on yourself to kind of produce something, um, and I think definitely when you're in grad school, you're always kind of thinking of, of quantifying what you're doing. Um, you know, don't don't worry about it quite so much. I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves because of what we're doing, and I think um, I think that can definitely be relaxed, and that will make the end. If we can t change the whole culture to make it a little bit more accepting to say we're talking about a process and not so much about like treating things and having them arrive at this you know this complete state. Great, thank you. Um, we should have time for. Another question or two. There's there's actually um, two questions from one viewer that seem to be related. Um, he says uh, we have no um, reviews in conservation, whereas in academic hospitals, morbidity and mortality conferences are held to instruct all after treatment failure. If doctors can confront failure preserving human life, we certainly should be able to do so with in in inanimate objects. Um, and he also says, is our discomfort at handling error? An, an example of how we're still transitioning from a studio practice towards an academic, more laboratory-based uh, field. So um, if we could have our speakers respond to that again, maybe you could start with um, Tony this time. Well, uh, that's interesting. I've thought about that um, uh, the morbidity panel kind of approach. Um, I think it takes a certain, again, um, decisiveness on the part of who's leading the lab, lab or the uh, de department. Um, um, I, I could imagine if it became a regular feature in the programs, it might well migrate um, into labs the way everything does. Um, <clears throat> um, I think it's a good idea. I'm not quite sure how it would um, be uh, um, instigated in various places, and and it might be a real problem in some places because there's, there's a there are different cultures in different departments and labs, and uh, some are more open and some less so. Um, anyway, uh, maybe someone else wants to take a a crack at it. I can actually. Uh, this is Michelle. And uh, Sarah Macy has done some interesting research into reporting structures in the UK in the medical fields. She's looked at both nursing and also surgery where they're, they're central repositories for mistake reporting and uh, then discussion. And she offers those as, as models for our profession. Uh, and Atul Gawande is also, uh, in his very interesting book, The Checklist Manifesto, 
uh, given some interesting data on ER mistakes and how uh, encouraging nurses to report on the steps that went wrong during surgery have dropped the rate of error significantly. So that's empowering everybody in the system, right? Not just um, the, the top dogs in the system to, to help uh, as watchdogs and, and correctives to, to the inevitable human error that'll take place. Thank I, you. I went, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I wonder what kind of checklists might be valuable for our profession um, in, in various disciplines of our profession, that might be a really interesting thing to think about and um, Oh, I agree. It would be great to make a couple models and float them out there and see if mm -hmm. people can work with them and if, and if in fact, they do uh, cut down on our tendency mm -hmm. to have things go wrong. Yeah. This is Geneva. I think that would actually be a really productive way of starting starting this conversation. Don't start it with an error, but start it with how we can, you know, begin to develop ways of, of preventing them. That'd be really interesting. Great. Great, thank you. Um, Aisha, did you have any thoughts on, on this one? Yeah, actually, I was just thinking, I, you know, we can compare ourselves to the medical profession in terms of we treat things and and all that, and we can definitely look at them as a as a model or as a, as a point of reference. But I think we have to find our own way to articulate this issue as well, and to really figure out what it means in terms of conservation. So I hope that you know I, th I think there's a tendency in conservation to kind of legitimize ourselves with science and uh, the academic model, but maybe we have something unique that could be offered as well, since we're dealing with culture. Absolutely. Um, I don't think we're going to have time for another question, unfortunately, um, but we will, um, if the speakers are willing, respond to any outstanding questions in a follow-up blog post. Um, and I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, if you have any additional questions or suggestions for future webinar topics, uh, please email at, um, ecpn.aic.webinar at gmail.com. And I also want to sincerely thank our speakers, Aisha, Geneva, Michelle, and Tony, for participating in this webinar. This has been a really fascinating discussion, uh, and your contributions to this topic have been really invaluable. Um, finally, thank you to the rest of the ECPN officers and to AIC for helping to organize and promote this event.